Hey everybody, how you doing? DJ John Michaels with you on this wonderful evening here today. And uh, I'll tell you what, we got something special going on for you right now. Um, just recently, a new book was released. Uh, it's called Good Lovin', My Life as a Rascal. And it was written by Gene Cornish, who is guitarist and singer for the Rascals, along with Stephen Miller. I, I have uh, actually been reading this book, and this is an amazing story. And uh, I'll tell you what, you guys are going to want to read this. Uh, I'd like to do real quickly a brief quote here. Uh, quote, Gene Cornish and I have been close friends since we first met in 1966. In that time, we have worked together, laughed together, and journeyed together through this amazing business. And no one is happier than I am to read Gene Cornish's incredible story. Unquote. And that is from none other than Tommy James and of Tommy James and the Shondells. And... On the phone with me right now, it is my great honor to have this amazing person with me, Mr. Gene Cornish. Hi, Gene. How you doing? Hey, everybody. How's everything up there? Oh, man. What a great thrill it is. You know, I interviewed you, uh, I think it was like six years ago, 2013, on Bullseye Radio. And uh, that was... Uh, a wonderful interview. We still keep that in our archives. Every once in a while, I, I go back to that and listen to it and remember the wonderful time we had on the phone talking about the rascals. So that was, uh, that was, that was the time we were going once upon a dream tour. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. That's exactly right. Yep. So um, I want to uh, get right into the meat of the subject here today. Uh, you wrote this wonderful book that I've been reading, uh, My Life as a Rascal, with Stephen Miller. And, uh, wow, what an amazing story this is. Well, you know, we spent two and a half years working on it. We wrote, we wrote every Friday at, our, at a friend's house in Edison, New Jersey. He had a lot... Him and his wife gave us the hospitality and the generosity to allow us to use their dining room table. And we would sit there for three, four hours, and I would laugh, I would cry, I would scream, I would pound the table. I would walk out the door, get a little air. I would hyperventilate. Going through my life, I didn't realize how many things I, I remembered, you know. And, uh, when you're talking about it, you know, when you're living your life, you're just busy living it. Mm -hmm. When you're chronicling it and you're having somebody write it down, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very, very touching and very, very emotional. Oh, I, I, I imagine it is. Because, you know, this book, this amazing book, uh, starts from your uh, humble beginnings in Canada all the way right up until just recently. Uh, that's where, you know, it goes through. And everything in between is really listed in this book. I pulled no punches. I really didn't scandalize anybody. I just told history the way I saw it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, when you first began, let's let's start right at the beginning. Uh, when you first began in Canada, uh, you were given a ukulele, and that is how you uh, got interested, right? That's uh, not completely correct. I was born in Ottawa, Canada, but my mother remarried Ted Cornish, an American, who brought us to New York, to New York when I was four years old. So about the age of nine or ten, he bought me he bought me a set of drums first. Oh, okay. From uh, Woolworth. Uh, and, and I started banging on them, and they only lasted one day. The next day, they disappeared. <laughs> it was too loud. <laughs> so he got me a ukulele because I used to strum on my grandfather's one-string guitar. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So you were in Rochester when you got the the ukulele. Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. And um, according to uh, the book here, you you didn't know how to read music. You just strummed on it. I don't. I still. I can't read enough music to mess up my playing. <laughs> I, I really, really don't, don't read. I can read chord charts and. Uh, play by ear. Most guitar players play by ear. They learn from each other. Uh, I, I learn myself. I taught myself. 
I had my idols, Scotty Moore from Elvis Presley, uh, James Burton from Ricky Nelson, the band, Dwayne Eddy, The Ventures, Link Ray. And, you know, I, I, I listened. I listened, and what happened is we had a bait store, a bait tackle store. My father sold fishing and hunting equipment. We had a radio behind the counter. It was on 24-7, very low, and it was on WBBF in Rochester. Mm-hmm. And that was my... Uh, that was my go-to station at the time. It was AM radio when when radio was really really rock and roll radio. It wasn't segregated. It was integrated. You did everything in those days. Right, right, yeah. I mean, today you you know the radio today is just uh, it's really more of a advertising uh, place rather than you know it was very interactive back in the day. Is what I'm saying, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, back then, first of all, back then, you would get, you would get the hits, you would get the hits of the local time from the 50s, the 60s at the time when I was there, but you would always get a Rudy Valley song, a Frank Sinatra song, uh, 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 Glenn Miller's song, so he, 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 I got, a, got quite a musical education from WBBF Radio, mm-hmm. and, I, and I, whenever I go back to Rochester to see my friends, I got inducted in the Rochester Hall of Fame a few years ago, and the first thing I talked about was WBBF. Hmm. Okay. So this book, this amazing book, I mean, w- let me ask you, what prompted you, what, what what put the idea in your head to write this book in the first place? Well, you know, I just started telling shows once in a while, and, uh, and my fiancé, Debbie Davis, and a friend of mine, Ira Model, kept saying to me for years, you got to do a book, you got to do a book, you got to do a book. And I couldn't find the right writer. I auditioned a couple of writers. One was like 21 years old, so he didn't have a clue. Another one was a writer for, uh, da- for the Daily News. Uh, and he didn't really have time. And finally, I met Stephen Miller three years ago at a recording, a chance meeting at a recording studio. And I was uh, doing a demo uh, for Mustang, Ford Mustangs, playing Mustang Sally with some friends. And he came, and it was a break. And I had my guitar, and I said, well, what do you do? I'm a writer. Oh, you're a writer. That's very nice. And I said, that didn't even think about it, you know. I said, you like rock and roll? He goes, yeah, I love it. You know much about it? Yeah, I do. So I have this game I play where I will play the intro to the song, only the intro. And you have to guess what it is. And he guessed 20 out of 20. And I said, you know what? I think that's the man for me. He, <laughs> he was the man. Yeah. And, and and let me tell you, the, the the songs of the Rascals, I mean, these are songs that, you know, uh, for example, It's a Beautiful Morning. That opening lick, you know, you get three notes and everybody in the world knows that song. You know, yeah. it's amazing. You know? <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's quite a compliment. At the time, you know, we were just playing off the top of our heads, being emotional. We had played together for uh, nine months, so we knew exactly what we were doing, but we had it. We had created a whole bunch of different licks and, and parts of guitar parts and stuff like that for other songs that we were covering, that we were changing a little bit. And so we had a backlog and a library, in my mind, of what I what I could throw out there at the time. Mhm. Now, uh, were you the writer of the of the 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 lyrics to the songs, or was it a com- combination of the whole group, or was there somebody specific? The hits were written by Felix Cavallari and Eddie Pagotti. Felix would write uh, the melody, the lyrics, and I would write the the idea for the song, and then he would hand it over to Eddie. Eddie would write a bunch of lyrics and Taylor would then edit it down and, and and that's how it worked. I was able to write two songs in each album. I sort of had the position of George Harrison in the sense that I was allowed to do two songs. <laughs> no, okay. Um, and Felix, actually Felix Cavallari actually did the foreword to this book. Yes, he did. He was very kind and generous. Yep, yep. And, uh, actually, the fact that he had, had not read the book, he just was was very open and very kind to me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so your beginnings with the Rascals, 
uh, there were some pretty rough times as far as management goes, getting uh, getting uh, uh, representation. We couldn't find the right management until we met Sid Bernstein. He was the man who brought the Beatles to Shea Stadium. He changed our lives totally. Mm-hmm. So without a doubt. Okay. But there were people before him. Well, people before him who just wanted to control us and steer us down the wrong path. And we had our own views of what we wanted. Well, luckily, we were, we've been around for years, so we've been in the business. We knew what 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 to do and what not to do at the time. We were very fortunate and blessed. The fact that we did not do any missteps for a long time. Mm hmm. Right. And uh, so you you uh, you started out just doing small little clubs for very little money at the time. Oh, uh, you know, it was different back then. Uh, you could live on a hundred dollars a week, and you could pay your rent, and, and you could eat and then play, and, and you had a job six nights a week. So you got you got paid to play. You didn't have to have a day job, and then like most bands do now, you know, the younger bands, the younger bands don't have to pay a club to live and play. It's just very, 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 it's very weird. And you know, basically, we 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 were a typical garage band. When we didn't start in a garage. We started in Felix father's basement in Pelham, New York. We went to the, we went to the Churchill Club in, in Garfield, New Jersey. We played there for six weeks. And by then, we were really, really tight. I mean, it was just, you, you know, when you're playing six sets a night, six nights a week, it's like rehearsing for six hours a day. Only you're getting paid and you're performing in front of people. So it, it, was, it was a great time. And a great era for bands and rock, young bands at the time. Mm hmm. So, and from those humble beginnings, you went on to to be one of the biggest names in the rock and roll industry. And uh, you know, all the all the uh, the trials and tribulations and everything is chronicled in this book. And I, I find you know, as I read this book, that I'm really uh, in awe of of some of the things you know that you accomplished, um, not knowing a how to read music uh, that well, and you know just your drive, your drive. Uh, I mean, it it was very inspiring to me. The desire of the young man, if you feel that you want to do something, whether it's to play baseball or or or, or be a policeman. But being a rock and roll musician, you're driving, you have tunnel vision, that's what you want to do. You have your idols, you have a big band to play, and I had the backing of my mom and dad, so it, it, was, it, was, it, was, a, it was a perfect situation for me. Mm -hmm. Right, as you uh, as you said, uh, actually in your book too, uh, you said that uh, you got a taste of uh, of being on stage and, and you knew that that was exactly what you wanted to do. Oh, without a doubt, you know, when I when I had my mom take me to go see Buddy Holly and the Everly Brothers in 1958, mm -hmm. I was already had a band for two years. Uh, but I saw them and I said to mom, I turned to mom, I said, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh. <laughs> and, uh, and so far, so good. Did you, did you ever, Gene, for, you know, as you, in your beginnings, did you ever think to yourself that, one day you would be rubbing elbows uh, with the likes of Tony Orlando, Tommy James, and the Shondells, and all these big, huge names. Well, you know, I grew up with uh, with uh, I, I knew Tony was since I was seventeen years old. Like I can see in the picture, he had uh, halfway to paradise. Dark, and I had a small record on and a small label. We were in New York at a record hop, and we met. We became fast friends, and then after Good Love in nineteen sixty five. Tommy had the uh, Panky Panky out, and we became friends again. And I see, I see Tommy at least twice a month. I, I go to his house twice a month, and we just talk about rock and roll, politics, baseball. The things that rockers do. Yeah, just like... Even you, at our age. Yeah, just common, just like your best friend, just talking like your best friend. Yeah. 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 So, tell me about no. the... Tell, tell me about the white guitar. 
<laughs> this is this. I, I watched you in another interview talking about this guitar, and you you said uh, I, I I don't think it's an exact quote, but it's close to what you said uh, that this was the mother of of guitars. <laughs> Tell me about that guitar. Well, that guitar is a Johnny A model. It's a, it was given to me for once in a dream. It was a basically smaller version of the guitar that I played, which is a Barney Kessel double cutaway. Mm. And it was made so well, and I enjoyed the I don't have it anymore, but uh, uh, it, it... So you don't have that guitar anymore, then? No. Okay. But that was, like, one of your favorite guitars at the time, right? Well, there are times when you have guitars that you love, and then you move on to something else, like a car, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You enjoy your you enjoy your nineteen sixty five Corvette, but then you get a Jaguar nineteen sixty eight. You know, so that's the deal. Right, right. Uh, in reading this book, um, I have to wholeheartedly agree with you that there's not one thing in here at all. Uh, regarding people, where you know people tear people up in in different books and stuff like that, and you don't do any of that. You have great respect for the people as you write about them in your book, and I have to compliment uh, and, and applaud you on that. So, you know, all the people, all the people in my life, whether they're good or bad, were part of forming my life. Uh, if they, if they were not good to me and I was there, it was my fault. If they were good to me, I was blessed. And so, basically, the people. That I write about, I'm not going to write about somebody uh, because I don't want to hurt them or because I don't want to slander them. I've always had a problem with music critics. Mm -hmm. music, music critics, for some reason, uh, always take that word too seriously. Well, they got to criticize something. And, and they'll, they'll slam somebody's work that somebody worked two, three years on. My attitude was if you're a critic, why don't you, instead of slamming somebody you don't like, Turn people on to something you do like. Good for you. Good that's, for you. That's, not, that's how I say be, po be positive. There's a lot of great work out there. We don't need to slam other people's work. We need to promote people's work. Right, right. And you know, there's a, there's so many people out there, and uh, I'm sad to say, in my industry, in the in the uh you know the interviewers and and broadcasters and everything there are so many people out there that just go about things the wrong way they don't know how to have respect for people and treat people you know we have that in government now we have that we have it in our government we have it in society we have it everywhere you know yeah you know i grew up respecting everything i grew up respecting the policeman on the corner i grew up respecting my teachers right. it's just me I, was, I wasn't a personally rebellious kid. I wanted to be a rock and roller. I told my dad when I graduated high school, I said, I don't want to go to Columbia University. I want to go to Columbia Records. So two and a half years it took you to write, write this book, right? Two and a half years. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and let me ask you a question. How did you know when the book was finished? You know, because... You know, well, I thought I thought I thought the book was finished until I was in Billings, Montana, a year ago on stage, and and got a cardiac arrest, right. and was collapsed on stage, and I was pronounced dead by the EMS workers, and they brought me back to life, and I realized that I had another chapter to write. So, and I heard about I that. I, I I had heard when about you, when that. When you get to the last when you get to the last stage, it says. Uh, I'm blessed with life. I'm not dead yet. Right. That was that must have been so scary for you. No, no, I, I didn't experience anything because I was out. Yeah. I just I woke up. I, I woke up in an ambulance, and somebody said to me afterwards, "Did you see the light? Did you see a light or something?" When you, I said, "No, the only light I saw was on the roof of the ambulance." Oh, gosh, gosh. Uh, no, you uh, go on to say uh, about this wonderful woman, uh, Debbie, that she is the light of your life. And uh, how, how how long have you been with? How long have you been with Debbie? Eight years. Eight years. Well, God bless her. God bless her for sure. Um, I got I got sober within the time. Really? I stopped doing all all substances that I and stuff that was hurting me. And I've been, I've been sober ever since. What, what do you, Gene? What, 
what do you what do you hope that people walk away from reading this book? What do, what do you what do you hope that they well, walk away with? I don't really I've not really thought about it that much. Uh, it's not in my second interview. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I want to, I I hope that they'll come back out of it just knowing that I loved my life, how blessed I was, how happy I am with my success, how happy I am with my sobriety, how happy I am with the things around me. And basically, the experiences that we had before of us, this book was, this book was written with, with the thought of every, everything that the last of did together, the wonderful things we did together, and some of the bad things we did to each other afterwards, you know. Success, success can turn around on you and bite you on the rear end. Right. And after a while, it, it, it gets to the point where you, 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 all all acts, all bands, all singers, all songwriters, they have they have a certain time of run. They have a run, whether it's five or six years. Uh, and, uh, and during that time, if you're blessed and lucky to be successful, then you have what you call a legacy, you hope. So, and fortunately, the, the songs that were written by the Rascals, uh, I've been told, just hold up very well over the years. The Rascal songs are legendary. Legendary. I grew up listening to the Rascals, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it, that, that brings me to a question. If you had to pick one song, just one song, that was your favorite Rascal song, which one would it be? This is the most popular question to ask me. <laughs> I bet it is. <laughs> but my answer is, all of those songs are like our children. How do you choose your favorite child? This is true. This is so true. But you know what? But I must tell you, I titled the book Good Lover because that was our first hit. That that was going to be my next question. Why did why the title Good Lovin'? <laughs> well, it was, it was suggested by Debbie. It was really they're going to call Groovin with Jean Cornish, but Good Lovin' had much more spark to it. And and she told me, I think you should, you might want to consider Good Lovin' as my life at the rest. And she's right. Mm -hmm. It really hits home. It, it's a it's a good it's a good word. You know, I I I got to tell you. Um, I, I love the Rascals' music, and it's really the same for you, you know, is, is the same for me. It's hard to pick one Rascal song that I really love the most, but I think that above all the rest, Groovin' would probably be, me, be my favorite. I mean, you know, it's just one of those songs, Groovin', that I close my eyes and I listen to that song, and I see myself sitting out in the backyard with a beer in my hand, sunshine, beautiful breeze, family and friends around you know it's it's just a feel-good song you know people always relate to a certain song and something that happened in their life whether they're sitting on the beach they're breaking up with a girl or a guy or they're, or they're meeting something for the first time or, or they're just having a picnic with mom and dad and, and the siblings mm -hmm. uh, it's always something it's always something i have I have songs in my past, when I hear them, they just trigger, you know, they trigger that moment. I listen to Beverly Brothers' Kathy's Clown, and it triggers the summer, summer's day when I'm getting ready to go play at, at, at the age 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, I get those the songs, Run Away by Del Chan, you know. Yeah. Do you still the songs. Do, you, do you still get nervous when you appear in concert? You know, I didn't... Uh, I haven't gotten nervous in 65 years. Basically, I must tell you the truth, and I'm being, I'm being very humble and correct. I remember being nervous the first time I played by myself when I was 12. Huh? <laughs> it, was all new, it was all new to me, and as soon as I got the applause, I go, okay, I got this. <laughs> Good for you. And uh, so how many, uh, let me ask you, how many of the original members are, are still with us uh, here? All of us. Every single one of them. Oh, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. It's amazing that we're all alive and yet we don't get along enough to play together. Because we, you know, we've lost lost so many wonderful artists over the last ten years. You know. We're, we're losing. We seem to be losing one a month now. Yeah. Yes. When we get we get up to my age. I turned seventy five in May. So when we get up to my age, and oh, so many stuff. Stops working a little bit, you know, and we get we get the back aches and we get this, we get that. I, I'm a, I, I've had a couple of bypass surgeries. I've had colon cancer. I survived. I, I've been through quite a few things, but you know what? I'm. Lying.
alive and I'm not dead yet. You know, God is smiling on you, my friend. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> I appreciate you calling me this morning. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, let me, before you go, uh, do you have a website, or where can people get this book? This book is on Amazon.com. Amazon.com. All right. But, uh, good, loving, good loving my life as a rascal, and I hope you'll enjoy it. This is a selling very well. We're getting great reviews. Anybody who buys the book, they like the book, I ask them to please write a review and put it on Amazon so it goes more viral. You got it, my friend. Gene, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time today. This is a wonderful book. What I've read so far, I'm three quarters of the way through it, and let me tell you, what I've read so far is just an amazing story, and it is just wonderful. It is wonderful. Listen, I thank you so very much, Rivera. I'm very appreciative for your comments. Uh, put the word out there. Let's put the word that's keep the last of the lies. All right. Please uh, please hang on for one moment while I uh, say goodbye here to the people, because uh, I want to say goodbye to you uh, off air uh, personally. All right, so just hang on for a minute, Gene, all right? Absolutely. Okay, great. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. It is Gene Cornish. Good Lovin', My Life as a Rascal, his brand new book written with Stephen Miller. You can pick it up at Amazon.com, and it is an amazing read. I am three quarters of the way through it myself, and it is an amazing read. We love Gene Cornish. We love the Rascals. And if you love Gene Cornish and the Rascals, and especially if you've seen them in concert, you want to read this book. It will keep you mesmerized. So there you go. I'm DJ John Michaels. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this wonderful interview with Gene Cornish of the Rascals. And uh, we'll be talking to you real soon. Until next time, keep good loving in your life. One, two, three, good love.